Oh, you need my phone. Welcome to the West Park Baptist Church. My name is Pastor Sanders, and we're going to take a look at Acts, the seventh chapter, verses 51 through 30. Dean Carter, Kevin here. Cheers on a successful uh, re. Amen. All right, while we are waiting on our radio audience to join us on 1220, find your way to Acts the seventh chapter, verses 51. When we find that text, you're going to find a great story about Stephen's mission and ministry. Stephen's mission and ministry. And I want you to think about your mission and your ministry. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for making this moment possible. We're taking a look at Acts, the seventh chapter. My name is Pastor Sanders. I am the pastor of the West Park Baptist Church. We're located here at three off, uh, 4600 West 150th Street in Cleveland, Ohio. We have our 8 o'clock service, 9.30 Sunday school, and now we join you for our 11 o'clock worship, which is on the air, on radio, and social media. We're glad to be in this service one more time. Let us pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. Ministry today is very exciting. To have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is very exciting and very comforting. There are some things that I know that I do not have to worry about that others who do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ are ultimately concerned with. That's okay. It's okay for people to be who they choose to be. That's okay. Everyone does not have to be like me in order for me to be happy or for the world to be a perfect place. It is okay for you to be who God made you to be. Furthermore, it is okay for you to discover who God made you to be. 
I am a firm believer in the freedom to fail and the opportunity to succeed. That means that I must get myself out of the way in order for other persons to have the freedom to make some mistakes. We all make some mistakes in this life. It's okay. You will recover. You will heal. A large part of the focus of my ministry and my reading now has to do with healing. Healing everything. Healing your body, your mind, your soul, your money, your relationships, this world, our communities. And I am naive enough to believe that this healing can happen. I want for you to know today that it's okay for you to search, to try out new thoughts, new disciplines, to travel, to read different books, to talk to different people, to have different experiences. This life is a university. Enjoy. Enjoy. My prayer is that not only do you receive the proper diploma, but it is my hope and my expectation that number one, you will become a problem solver. Number two, you will begin to understand the universal nature of life in as much as we are all connected one to another. And somehow, I would hope that you would, in your own way, become self-aware. It is my hope, my prayer, especially after I read this story about Stephen, that you will become one of those persons who arrives at the point where you actually know yourself. You actually know who you are. I would hope that that knowledge and definition would go beyond your color. I would hope that that definition and self-awareness would go beyond your gender. I would hope that it goes beyond your economic class. I'll use one of the phrases that one of my former friends like to use, which is, I pray that you would become a citizen, a global citizen, or a citizen of the world. I say former friend because I've grown out of that relationship. And I pray that you will grow out of some of the relationships that you have established in your life. Some relationships, in fact, all relationships are for but a season. That's a hard lesson. I never made a conscious effort to prepare myself to live after my mother and my father were deceased. I assumed that they would always be here. One passed on to glory 2004 and the other in 2009. And since that time, I have had to grow up. And I have grown out of my childhood stage. I can never return. I pray that some of us might grow up. The story about Stephen is a story of a man who was a grown man. He has made some decisions. He is determined by his actions that for Christ I will live and for Christ I will die. I will submit to someone this morning, if you are hearing me, that if you never find something in your life that you are willing to die for, you have not lived. I pray that in this life you might find something that you embrace so fervently that you are willing to give your life because whatever you embrace matters more. This story about Stephen being stoned to death is that kind of story. This story begins with a speech and I might 
capture your attention this morning if I said to you, I realize this morning that I have a confession to make. I have a confession to make. Yes, it's true. This morning I have a confession to make. But here's what I already know. Before I say a word, that some of you have assumed that because I said I have a confession to make, you have assumed that I've done something wrong. Before I even say a word. Furthermore, you have assumed, some of you, that because I have declared this morning that I have a confession to make, that I deserve some type of punishment. You've already got there. I haven't said a word. Thirdly, I would suggest that if you and when you heard me say I have a confession to make, you have already assumed that whatever I have to confess is going to affect my life. It might even be a life and death situation. And you may be right. But before I give you my confession, and I will, I want to compare the difference between a confession and a profession. Because if I were to say I have something to profess, and I do, I think you would make the same kind of assumptions. I would think that you would say to yourself, he's got something to say about something that he's going to do wrong. He's got something to say about something that's going to involve punishment or judgment. He's got something to profess that is going to affect my life or his life. I do have a profession. And you may be right about all those assumptions that you have made before I have even said a word. But let me be clear. Stephen had something to profess. Stephen even had something to confess. But he never gets to his confession. He gets to his profession. And his profession is about the tradition and the history and the legacy and the lineage of the children of Israel as they came out of Egypt and they were bound for the promised land. And he makes it clear that they were so unworthy. They were unworthy because they were disobedient. They were unworthy because they resisted the Holy Spirit. They were unworthy because they slayed the prophets. They were unworthy because they slayed the men and the women of God. They were unworthy because they pretended to be holy, but they were unholy. They were unworthy and Stephen was talking about those of yesteryear and their fathers, but he said to the council of Sanhedrin, you are no more worthy than your fathers were. My God. The text says that they began to gnash him with their teeth that they had to realize would affect the rest of of their life because if they adhered to the words of Stephen, they would have to make a change. And no one, not from a baby to an elderly person that I have met, likes to make change. We like things the way they are, and we might accept some gradual change. But we want things to stay the way they are. I have two confessions to make. This is the first one. I, if I had my choice, if I can make time stand still, 
I would make time stand still and I would stay at the point in my life where my mother would go to work and come home and my sister would cook dinner and we would set the table and we would put the fork where the fork was supposed to go, the spoon where the spoon was supposed to go, the plate where the plate was supposed to go, the glass and the napkin and the butter dish and the pitcher and we would wait on my mother and everyone to come to dinner. It did not matter what time everyone got there. We did not eat until everyone arrived and if I could make time stand still, I would like that period where I sat on my chair in my corner at the table and looked at my siblings and my family and ate a dinner and discussed religion and politics and love and chores and school. If I could make time stand still, I confess, I'd like for that time to last forever. A time where I could sit at the table and, and not have a worry. More than enough to eat, heat on, lights on. No TV, no cell phone. Just my family there discussing their life. Those were the good old days. I have that to confess. Stephen had a profession. When he professed, not only did they bite him, but the text says that they closed their ears. They couldn't stand to hear anymore because they knew they had done something wrong. They knew they deserved punishment. They knew that what he was saying was going to affect their life. And they didn't want to have any of it. Bible says that not only did they close their ears, but, but they rushed him in one accord, all of them, on the same accord. They, they mobbed him. They, they mobbed him like a, a lynch mob. Some of us have no need to understand what a lynching is. I don't have that luxury because there is a very strong tradition of lynching in my predecessor's history. Lynching by any means necessary. Lynching by hanging, lynching by dismemberment, lynching by shooting, lynching by tar and feather, lynching by boiling, lynching by dragging or being tied to a horse or a vehicle, lynching by drowning, lynching by suffocation, lynching by having your head decapitated. That's in my history. I didn't choose it. I didn't ask for it. But I know my history. And I know what has happened to men that look just like me and Stephen. Wow. You may want to look at this from some uh, pie in the sky, super detached spiritual perspective, but this was a lynching. And yes, my people were stoned to death. But hear me now. There was no crime. But they were punished. There was no crime. But they were found guilty. There was no crime. And often it cost them their life. Stephen committed no crime. Stephen was punished. Stephen had to give his life. And he was innocent. When is it going to stop? This is a lynching. Oftentimes, 
because people do not understand. They like to deflect or pretend to be knowledgeable on areas that they are not knowledgeable on. I realized when I stood at the Mount Pleasant United Methodist Church on January 4, 2005 to preach my mother's eulogy as her body lay right before me in the same spot that I preached my grandmother's funeral in 1991. I realized as my mother lay there and as I felt things in my heart that I had never felt before, I realized that all of the funerals that I had preached prior to that of so many persons, mothers, I realized in a moment that all those times I had preached those eulogies and funerals, I had no idea what I was talking about. Because I had never felt that kind of pain. And I realized in a moment that unless you have gone through some things that people have gone through, you have no idea what they're going through. Sometimes you have to go through it. Today we have a new era of attack on black men that is no different than this attack on Stephen. No crime, no crime, maximum punishment, maximum punishment, and sometimes it may cost your life or if at the minimum it will affect your life for the rest of your life. No crime. People might say, well, I understand. No, you don't. You have no idea what it's like to be a black man in America. You have no clue. You have no idea of the psychological welfare, world warfare. You have no idea of the many pitfalls and traps that are not only set in stone but legalized. You have no idea of the overkill of punishment. You have no idea what it's like to not only not be able to provide a livelihood but to have your livelihood taken for no reason. You have no idea what it's like to be punished and there's been no crime. You have no idea to be in a situation where you can give your life for no reason and it can happen at any time. Anywhere, and really by anyone. All you have to do is be accused. Lord have mercy. And that is a burden that white America simply does not have. They understand it, but they don't have it. Because more times than not, they are the accuser and the judge. I'm not talking about what I heard. I'm not talking about my opinion. I'm talking about my life. I'm talking about traveling this world as a black man. I'm talking about going to the highest schools in this world as a black man. I'm talking about traveling these United States urban America and small town America as a black man. And if you want to lie and say you don't understand, trade places with me. I bet you won't do that because you do understand. Not what they have done, but what you have done, what you have believed, and the false God that you have served. Stephen was lynched for no crime by people who he was going to expose and he was exposing and no one wants to be exposed. Today if you call the most staunch racist a racist, they'll say I'm not a racist. I didn't have anything to do with slavery. Those are my parents, or those people have died. I don't even know those people. But you haven't given back any land. You haven't given back any of those benefits. You haven't removed any laws off the books. 
you haven't done any action, action is not pacifying those who have been oppressed and telling them that everything's going to be all right. Action is not saying that times have changed when you know and I know that times have not changed. Racism and all of its cousins, aunties and friends and family have just gotten more sophisticated. Stephen was lynched for no good reason other than he saw the light and realized that if you don't learn how to give to somebody, your life is in vain. It is in your giving that you will find living. If you never sincerely give without expecting something in return, you are a walking dead man or woman. Wow. I want for us today to understand that the poverty that affects our spirits manifests itself in our division. We are divided along religious lines. That's poverty. That's poverty in the community of believers. There ought not be any division in a holy, sanctified, and ordained body. Did anybody hear me? There ought not be any division in a holy, ordained, and sanctified body. It should be us against the world and the devil. But it's not. Every war that we can trace our hands to including this war in the Ukraine, has some religious implications. Haiti, Ireland, Russia, they may talk about economics, but most people didn't know that President Aristide, I forget his first name, Jean Aristide, I believe, he's a Catholic priest. Most of the wars that we have have their foundations in religious differences because we think that our religion is superior to your religion and we declare that God has ordained us to treat you like a savage. Bishop de la Casa, Spain and Portugal, he is seeking to protect the Indians. At that time, they were called. He makes a declaration that they can go to Africa and draw the line of demarcation, and they can treat those occupants of Africa as savages, all in the name of Jesus. In nomine patri et filia et spiritus sancti. Amen. Any division in an ordained, sanctified, and holy community is not of God. It is not of God. And I don't want any parts of it. I want to be a part of the community of faith. Wherever there is division, there is poverty. I want you to know where Stephen was. Stephen, according to the report, was serving tables and feeding people. But while he was serving tables and feeding people and really helping people, they came and got him. I need for you to not miss that. He was not disturbing anyone. Stephen was serving God. And he was doing it in a miraculous, outstanding, amazing way. If you do anything to the glory of God, I'm going to let you know that in this world, somebody's going to get jealous. And they might get jealous enough to accuse you of something. 
They came and accused Stephen of saying that Jesus Christ said that he would destroy the temple and in three days he will build it up. And the leader said, did you say that? As if they understood what he said. Did you say that? Stephen didn't back down. He doubled down. He went on and he told about the whole tradition of how the children of Israel had been disobedient all through the days of Moses, all through the days of deliverance, all through the days of excellence, all through the days of entrance into the promised land. They had never been righteous, never been righteous. It is amazing how people who have never been righteous are always the one who wants to call somebody to accountability when it comes to righteousness. They had never been righteous. Stephen called the roll. He ended by saying, not only did your fathers not do it, but neither do you do it. You don't even do it today. I don't know if they realized that even as he accused them of killing the prophets and the men of God, they were killing the man of God right then and there on that spot. But because they were filled with emotion, filled with the desire for blood, filled with the desire to do what they thought were right in their sight, and filled with the desire to cover themselves, Filled with the desire not to be exposed, filled with the desire not to be punished, filled with the desire to not have their way of life changed. Let's make America great again. They sought to kill him. The text says that they rushed upon him in one accord. Because God is who God is, God will not leave you by yourself. Because God is who God is, God is no respecter of persons. Because God is who God is, God will allow for man to think they have the victory when they're really losing. And in this case, they thought they were going to gain the victory by shutting Stephen up, but they lost because they lost one of the greatest gifts that God had given them, which is a man who was full of the Holy Ghost, willing to serve, willing to heal, willing to save, willing to give a word, an honest word, from the Lord, which would be liberating, but they did not want to be liberated. I'm going to say it again. They did not want to be liberated. They did not want to be liberated. The greatest tragedy in this life that there are people who know that they are in bondage, but they do not want to be liberated. There are some people who know they are addicted, but they do not want to be clean or free. There are some people who are in hellacious relationships, but they do not want to be in good relationships. There are people who are suffering right now who are in bondage mentally, spiritually, psychologically, and every other way, but they do not want to be free. The question becomes, do you want to be free? Do you want to be free? Do you really want to be free? It is a great tragedy when they are those who are like those in the Old Testament who were set free. They were set free. They were slaves, but they were set free. But they said, no, 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 no. I don't want to be free. And so when they came back to their master, their master said, bore a hole in their ear and give them an earring so that everyone knows that they had been set free. They were set free from their bondage, but they said, no, no, no. We don't want to be free. We want to be slaves. Therefore, put a hole in our ear and we will wear an earring to let everyone know that we like being in bondage. We like being slaves. We prefer this life to a free life. We want to be here on this plantation. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a slave. I don't want to be on the plantation. I want to be free. I want the opportunity to fail. I want the opportunity to succeed. I want to search the highest mountains. I want to search the lowest valleys. I want to go to the depths of the world. I want to go everywhere. I want to meet everybody. I want to expose, be exposed to every religion. I want to be exposed to every culture, every food. I want to live. I want to do more than just survive. I want to live. I want to live. And God said that I can have life. God so loved the world. <laughs> and he gave his only son. Huh? That whosoever would believe in him would not die but have life. He came that I might have life. Why would I live a life in bondage when my Jesus has given his life so that I might have life? He was rich and he became poor so that through his poverty we might become rich. 
I want the rich life. I want the abundant life. And last I checked, it wasn't a crime. Amen? Lord, have mercy. You don't know what it's like to be a black man. And I don't wish it on you. Because you probably can't handle that. Amen? You can't handle what the world tries to give me. Oh, no, you can't handle it. But God made us unique. And we handle it. Some handle it better than others, but, but we handle it. And, and when we've got Emmanuel with us, we, we really handle it. Lord have mercy, I'm not going to call the role of all the great men who have overcome, but uh, one, one, one was Jesus. Lord have mercy, one was Jesus. I'm just going to leave that there. I do have a confession to make. I do. I do. I'm going to confess on the internet, and I'm going to confess on the radio. I have a confession to make. I was wrong. Here's what I did. I forgot to renew my license plate. I was wrong. Some of you all remember the time during COVID where they said you don't have to renew them. In fact, the offices were closed. You couldn't even go in. That time has passed, but I let it slip my mind. I forgot to renew my tag. I forgot to renew my tags on my vehicle and the church vehicles. I just forgot. And you know what? I was wrong. Y'all hear me? I was wrong. Now, I have confessed. I have done something wrong. The next question is, what is the proper punishment or is punishment even necessary oh if I were a white man this would not be a punishable offense but I am a black man and not only do I have to fight powers and principalities but I have to avoid the paternal glare of the police department. I hope y'all hear me. And the police don't enforce the same laws with a black man that they do with a white man. Mm. Unfortunately, there is a real possibility that me not renewing my tags might affect my life. Now, if I were a white man, it would be no big deal. But I'm not a white man. I'm a black man. And having expired tags could cost me my life. Oh, I wish I had a witness. <laughs> now, I don't expect white folk to understand this. Well, I take that back. You understand it, but you wouldn't trade places with me because you know the rules just like I do, only sometimes we pretend like we don't. Well, I was wrong on two counts because not only did I forget to update and renew my tags, but I gave my car to my son to drive. Black folk already know where this is going, amen? Because we know the rules.
as a grown black man to drive a luxury vehicle is a problem for some folks. But as a young black boy driving a luxury vehicle, that's a major problem. That's a major problem. But it's my fault. It's my fault. If you understand being a black man, it, it's my fault. I forgot the rule. Maybe I was acting like a white man. I thought that it was a minor offense, not a big deal. But when you're a black man, oh, it's a big deal. Ha! I'm confessing. Because Stephen never made a confession. He made a profession. And he lost his life. And he never did a thing. Maybe having expired tags is a big deal in some folk eyes under some circumstances. And I'm trying to explain the circumstances. Well, I gave my car to my son, and he's driving back from the Ohio State where he is a student. That's a problem for some folk, too. And, you know, he likes to wear his hat, baseball cap. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what culture you're from, but I don't think that's a crime. He had on his white t-shirt. They sell white t-shirts, they don't have a label on them saying it's a crime to wear a white t-shirt, but in some folk culture, depending on who's wearing the t-shirt, it could be a crime. I know he had his seat laid back. So he was driving on down the freeway. He wasn't speeding. But when the policeman, the state Ohio State trooper saw him, he said, there goes a crime. Not speeding, no broken taillight, car wasn't even dirty. But it was a black boy driving a nice car with a hat and a white t-shirt, and there goes a crime. And I got to confess, it was my fault because he had expired tag. Y'all still with me? Well, I'm going to fast forward because some of you all think that we're just making this up. Some of you all think, you know, if you do something wrong, you deserve the maximum punishment. Some of you think that, that this won't affect your life, but, but it could. Make a long story short, two exits from our exit. They stopped my boy. He happened to have a friend in the car with him. Thank God he had a witness. Uh, they told the car, but here's the killer. The Ohio State Trooper said, what are you doing driving this nice car. What in God's name, I'm using real nice language, does that have to do with him driving down the freeway? What are you doing driving this nice car? It must be a crime. Y'all hear me? It must be a crime about to be committed or been committed because you're driving a, a nice car. My son said, well, look, we're two exits away. My dad is at the church. If you can just give him a call, sure we can get this resolved, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No, 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 no. I'm taking this car. Taking it. I'm taking it. <laughs> I laughed when I heard that. I'm taking it because they're always trying to take it back. I'm taking it. They took OJ's trophy. I'm taking it. All the good work that Lewis Stokes did in his office, they took it back. They always want to take it back. I'm taking it. Sean Will, Deshaun Watson got $265 million. They're trying to take it all back. Somehow we're not worthy of having anything. We're going to take it. 
We're going to take your name. We're going to ruin your potential to earn. And we're going to take what you have. That's called modern day character lynching assassination. That's what it's like to be a black man today. Assassination and lynching is far more sophisticated. But y'all know I was hot when he rolled up here in an Uber. I said, where's my car? The police told it. Why? Spire tags. When does the police tow a car for expired tags? Well, he asked me, why was I driving a luxury car? When did it become a crime for anybody to drive a luxury car? I wonder if he had been, if his name was Sean Fitzgerald, if they would have towed his car. Or if he was uh, a Celeste or uh, uh, one of those names that begin with, end with an I or one of those names that, that is, ends with a Berg. I wonder if they would have towed his car. But they did. And I made sure that I had that car back within an hour. Because you ain't taking nothing from me that God gave me. Because you've taken enough. And enough is enough. Don't have to explain where I got it, how I got it, why I got it. Get yours. Leave mine alone. I'm not taking anything from you. Don't take anything from me. But it is your nature to take. It is your nature to be malicious. It is your nature to lie. It's not my nature. Because my father is rich in houses and in land. I confess I was wrong. I know the legal folk will say, oh, well, you were wrong. Until I asked, well, what if it was your son? Oh, well, that's different. That's different. That's different. It's always different. I got to move to those that were stoning Stephen, and then I can, I can take my clothes. I said that there is a thing called confession, and there's a thing called profession. <laughs> and let me say this before I move on. I'm a child of God. I know who I am. And if you mess with me, you got hell to pay. I'm not talking about what I heard. I'm talking about what I've seen. I don't know who I am and what God has for me to do, but, but I know I belong to him. And I know he takes care of me. And I know that I've watched some folk do some things or try to do some things for me, and it didn't work out all that well. That's why God said pray for your enemies because they ain't fighting against you. They fighting against the Lord, and they're going to lose. They're going to be broke down, busted, and disgusted. Pray for them fools that's got the nerve to try to take from the man of God what God gave to me. God says don't touch God's anointed. You go ahead. You can't touch this. And they've tried. They've tried repeatedly. And here I am. Can't lose a pound if I tried. Still happy, still sleeping well. Still blessed. Lord have mercy. That's when you know who you are. You're self-aware. No high school diploma having policemen going to take my stuff because he's jealous. Lord have mercy. I get an understanding of how God must have felt about Jesus. You're not going to do that to my son and get away. Every knee must bow. Every tongue must confess at the name of Jesus Christ because he came to help you. Lord have mercy. There was a group that sought to persecute Stephen, and they did physically. They had confessions and professions. They should have been confessing their sins, but they didn't have that much sense. 
they were afraid of uncovering their wrong, the punishment, and what it would do for their life. They wanted to maintain their life. They wanted to make America great again. They wanted things to be the way they used to be. And all of those things have nothing to do with God. They were unspoken in their wrongdoing. They were wrong, but they would not speak of it. But they picked up stone. They were wrong in their unspoken punishment that they deserved. They deserved punishment, but they kept it unspoken. They were wrong in the fact that they tried to conceal how accepting what Stephen said would affect their life how they would have to change their life. They were unspoken in the change that they knew that they had to make because it was right. Just because you don't speak of it, just because you think nobody knows what kind of devil you are, doesn't mean that you are any less of a devil. And it doesn't mean that you ain't going to bust hell wide open either. We need some solutions. We need healing. We need healing. I don't know if you know it, but healing comes from God. We need healing in our families first. And we need healing in our communities second. And the church might help if the church ever decided to do its job. Anything that leads to division is not of God, except that division be of light from dark, of evil from good. But other than that, there ought not be any division being professed or confessed. We need to deal with our fear problem. Why did that state trooper have to stop my boy? and his friend and try to take what he couldn't take because he was afraid. Ha <laughs> ha! He was afraid for his way of life. This young black boy riding down the freeway in a car that I can't afford. Next thing, he'll be in my neighborhood. Next thing, he'll be dating my daughter, my sister. Next thing, he might be my daddy. Lord, have mercy. They're afraid. I know why he had to stop my boy. It had nothing to do with expired tags. It had to do with the fact that my boy's mere presence exposed his mediocre life, his mediocre habits, his mediocre God. My boy serves an awesome God. <laughs> Solutions. We need unity. We need to stop thinking that this world is separate. It's not. We're a whole bunch of mutts. Everybody's mixed with something. Even myancestry.com says 10% Scandinavian. We're all mixed with something. We've been around for a long time, and folk been sleeping with who they want to sleep with for a long time. You can forget about being a pure Italian or a pure Irish or a pure anything because it's been a long journey, baby, and a whole lot of folk have fallen in love. Romeo and Juliet is not anything new. Romeo and Juliet is the way it is. The Montagues like to have relations with that other family. I forget their name. And they they are, are always somebody, there's always somebody sneaking behind the bound. Forbidden love is nothing new. Stolen bread is sweet according to the word of God. So don't you get high and mighty because you think you pure Albanian or pure Lithuanian or pure African or pure white. You are a pure, uneducated, ignorant fool. Only thing that's pure is the blood of Jesus. And it will wash you and make you whole again. The only thing that's pure is an encounter with the Holy Ghost. 
and the Holy Ghost will make you forget about all those divisions. The only thing that is pure is a right relationship with God. And when you have a right relationship with God, God will show you his, who his children is. He'll show you who the devil's children are too. And you even are called to pray for them. You don't have to join them, but pray for them. I want everybody to be blessed. Oh, just want my children blessed. I want everybody's children to be blessed. I want everybody to have what they need. I want everyone to be rich. And I know my God wants the same thing. Therefore, be ye of the mind that we are called to heal somebody and healing come from God. Be clear that we are not called to live in fear. Fear comes from Satan. Be clear that we need to be about harmony and unity in every facet of our life and unity and harmony, especially in our families, come from the Holy Spirit. It is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Spirit of the living God. Fall fresh on me. Make me, mold me to do thy will. To do thy bidding. Not as I will, but let thy will be done. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one heaven. And no one really wants to even talk about that other place. Oh, in Jesus Christ's name, we have the victory. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leaves me beside still waters. He restores my soul. All things are possible through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. I pray that you have uh, gleaned some food for the journey as we run this race. I pray that Stephen's sacrifice was not in vain, but that on this day you can be reminded of how selfless we are called to be when we work for Jesus Christ. We are not called to have on uh, the blinders of insensitivity, but we are called to have a heart like God. Jeremiah calls it a pastor's heart. We are called to have a heart like God. Separate yourself from those who you know are not of God's will so that we can come together as one nation under God and do the bidding of God. Jesus Christ came, wonderful, mighty counselor, healer, that he might establish a government upon his shoulders, and to that government there shall be no end. I want to be a part of that nation. It is a peculiar nation. Out of the darkness into the marvelous light we are a royal priesthood and that is our calling in jesus name we pray and we believe amen well i'm done but if we are still on i want to encourage you to pray for yourself if you want to write me a letter or email, I will answer it. Send me an email, a letter. I grew up in the pen pal age where we had pen pals all over the world. I remember fourth grade I had a pen pal. We were like write letters back and forth. I don't know whatever happened to my pen pal, but sometimes we need we need to communicate. You may have a prayer concern, you may have a special issue that you're working through. And, and I want the best for you. I want your body to be healed. I know God wants that. I want your finances to be uh, lucid uh, and, and liquid. I want for your family life to be great. And I know that if we pray on it together, and if we follow the exercises that are prescribed by our word, that we will gain the victory. I'm a living witness that God will give you the victory. If you walk by faith and not by sight, fasting and prayer works. The fervent and effectual prayer of the righteous works. These things work. And when we exercise them, we have supernatural power. 
sometimes we just have to stop doing some things and start doing some other things. But whatever we do, we must follow God and God's Holy Spirit. We must not be guilty of that which they are guilty of in this text in the seventh chapter of Acts. We cannot afford to resist the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit speaks to us, we got to move. We have to move. We have to walk by faith and not by sight. I pray your healing in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray your blessing of abundance in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray that you will have only the best, only the best. If it's not the best, you shouldn't have it. You should just, just set that aside. God has the best waiting for you because you are the best. You're made in the image of the master, the great mind, the great father. You're made in the image of God. Take this text and, and let it uh, bless your life and let it uh, illuminate your life. Let it bless your friendships. Let it bless your family. Let it bless your church relationships. Let it bless you financially. Learn how to give and save. Give and save. Give and save. If you need an economic book, you can read Think Rich and Grow Big. You can read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You can read The Science of Getting Rich. But you better read this Bible because it's the one that will get you rich the most effective and long-lasting way. And so I want to put your riches in a place where you can keep them and not in a place where the moths and the rusts can get them. Place your treasures where the Lord leads you to do so. And you can bless your generations for the next 400 years if you do it God's way. Make your life worth living. That's what we're talking about. So thanks be to God. It's not about today, even though we talk about daily bread. But it's about the next 400 years. Yeah, that's what it's about. That's, that's, that's what it's about. If you want to be like Jesus, it can be for the next 2,000 years. Jesus died 2,000 years ago. He's affecting us today. What's your story? Amen. We ready? All right. Thanks be to God. Thank you for this time together. Amen. Mm -hmm. Spirit of the living God fall fresh on me, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me, melt me, mold me, fix me, you living God.